Oh, hello, chat. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Hopefully, you guys are doing well. I will tell you, I am tired as crap today. <laughs> oh, man. Intensive week is already bad enough. If you guys don't know, it's eight hours of lecture every day this week. But now that I'm on Wednesday, you know, that's bad enough, right? So not only is it eight hours of lecture every day, on top of writing papers and reading and homework after that, but also it's at six in the morning. So I'm going from six in the morning till, what is it, 3 p.m. And then I have a group meeting where I have to meet with my classmates and do a group post, a group discussion post. And then we've got papers to write and uh, it's, it's all over the place. So I'm a little tired today and I've actually got more I've got to do. As soon as I'm done with the stream, I'm going to the gym. And then I've got to start, I've got to keep working on one of my papers that's due tomorrow night. So, <laughs> it is a long week. It's a long, long week. And we've got a long Bible study tonight. Well, the Bible study itself will be short, but the passage is long. <laughs> so we're doing the last section of chapter 15. All of chapter 16, which is a little bit longer. It's 35 verses. And then we have got all of chapter 17, which is a shorter chapter, 16 verses. But still, that's two chapters and what is that, like seven verses, six verses, something like that. So, got a longer section to go through. Hopefully you guys will watch it out with me and hopefully that will go well. Um, but how are you guys doing today? How are you guys doing today? It's good to see all of you. I'm glad that you are here. I'm glad that you are here for Bible study and ready to have a good time. Um, well, as always, we will wait, you know, just a couple minutes as we let people pour in tonight so that everybody is here for whenever we get started. So, yeah, I already told you guys about my day, so I'll have to hear about all of you guys' days as well. Um, it might just be me tonight. Um, not entirely sure. Uh, if there will be other people joining us or not, but we'll see, I guess. It's possible. Um, but yeah, how are you guys all doing today? Good oh, morning. Cole, you, <laughs> how are you doing tonight, man? Cole, it is good to see you. Thanks for stopping by tonight, man. Good to see you. Oh, it's good to see you too, Logan. Oh, and you're in Discord with me. How about that? It's really good to see you, man. How are you doing on this fine day? You want to tell me about your day? Tell me about your week. Uh, well, things are going better than last, or definitely better than last week. That's good to hear. That's good to I'm hear. I'm still having, I'm still having troubles with school, but it's like, it's like, okay, I'm having trouble with school. Eh, whatever. <laughs> it's, it's like, I, it could be a lot worse. My girlfriend could still be upset. Could be so upset at me, but she's not, so. <laughs> so, if you guys weren't in the Discord and you did not see, we have a massive praise on Cole's end. Uh, obviously, we'll go over that again when we get to the prayer quest section tonight, but big pra praise on Cole's part. There was uh, some stuff going on with school, uh, some pretty bad stuff, and it is mostly solved. So, big praise on that side, um, that that is all going so much better. But... And Nate, too. Good to see both of you. I'm glad that you're both here. Hey, Nate. Good to see you, you both. You should come join Logan. Come join us in Discord. Oh, yeah. It's good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here for a little bit of Bible study. I was going to say, Nate, are you doing the gym tonight? I think t I think you said Wednesdays you're doing gym. So you'd have to be here for only part of the session, if I remember right. Something like that. Which, if that's the case, you know. Feel free to be here as long as you can, but I won't take you for massive gains. Got back. Oh, okay. So you got back from the gym. Gotcha. Did some leg stuff. That's cool. That's cool, man. That's cool. That's what I'm talking about. So how do you feel about leg day? How do you feel about leg day? Leg day is not my favorite. If I had to rank them, I'd probably do... Well, I'm, I, so I currently am doing a push-pull legs workout routine, which if you don't know, essentially, for anybody in chat who doesn't know what that is, essentially, uh, push, 
is kind of self-explanatory. You do one day where you do all pushing workouts. So like you would do bench, you do like a shoulder press, all of that kind of stuff, right? And then you do a pool day, which is the next day right after that, where you're doing all pulling exercises. So you're doing like pull-ups, chin-ups, uh, rows, anything like that, right? And then legs is self-explanatory as well. You do legs. So you do three days in a row, push, pull, legs, and then you take a day off. And then you do push, pull, legs, and then you take a day off. And then I also incorporate a Sabbath into that as well, so I won't do on Sundays. So it's kind of like two-ish to three a week, depending on how it works that you'll have off days. Um, it, it, it gets really weird when you take Sundays off, essentially, because you have a four day workout routine in six day it's yeah but anyways it works out <laughs> but if i had to rank favorite muscle groups i like doing chest chest and arms are probably two of my favorites to work out um getting that chest pump or the bicep workout or the bicep pump you know it's a good feeling <laughs> um probably shoulders after that and back shoulders and back would probably be interchangeable chest first arms second back and shoulders pretty interchangeable as third or fourth then probably like lower body so i would just i just do like all leg workout groups together at the same time so that would probably be fifth and then anything cardio related would be sixth but if i had to rank cardio type exercises anything like a bike or stairmaster at the front and then running and stuff at the back. The reason for that is because whenever I'm going to work out at the gym, I'm prioritizing building muscle. You know, like different people prioritize different things. Some people prioritize, you know, getting faster whenever they're running or getting up endurance or trying to lift something. Like my goal is I just want to build muscle. So I'm trying to lift as heavy weight as possible. And if you are running, like really intense running on a treadmill or outside, it can actually be detrimental to that because it's a very hard, like running for long periods of time is really hard on your joints. It's really hard on your body, especially if you're trying to grow your leg muscles. So if you do the Stairmaster or the bike, those are a lot easier on your joints. Um, they're a lot easier on your body so that you can, you know, still get cardio in while still prioritizing muscle gains so that's how i that's how i do it at least but yeah i'm trying to do that do something like that and yeah it's weird especially because my gym is closed saturday afternoon and all day sunday really that is interesting well i mean i don't go on sundays but saturday is weird i feel like saturday afternoon is like one of the times where more people go i feel like a lot of people go saturday mm -hmm. afternoon to the gym so that's weird mm -hmm. Well, I don't do any of this gym going, you know that. <laughs> I do That's need to fair. start. I knew I do want to get some more. Uh, I need to get a. I want to get a lot more back and shoulder. Mm, okay. I want back and shoulder. Uh, most likely endurance use, uh, strength, endurance strength. So basically, being able to use it and hold. Most likely because of that's the main areas for uh, longbow shooting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm falling. I'm falling. Nice. But also, nice. It, it would it it would be nice to get bigger chest too. Bigger mm -hmm. chest, bigger arms. Uh, well, legs. I would prefer leg muscles. I wouldn't do legs for strength. I do them more for endurance. So more of endurance. So more running. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, man, absolutely. But uh, yeah, I mean, dude, it, it really is real. That chest pump and the the, arm, the bicep pump, those are two of the best feelings in the world. I gotta say, I gotta say, Nate, unless I pay for twenty four seven acts. Oh, okay, okay, so you could do Saturday afternoon, but you'd have to pay a little bit extra. That makes sense. Yo, make it rain, dude. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for coming back. I make it rain, dude. Absolutely. God bless. Well, hey, we're about to we're about to start our Bible study here in just a second. If you wanted to stick around, um, sorry, I had to get going pretty early last night. Pretty much as soon as I stopped stream, I had to get going to the gym. I was really cramped yesterday for time, but I wanted to, you know, we had some viewers last night, and I wanted to bless somebody else's night. So hopefully that put a smile on your face and blessed your night. 
Um, but yeah, man, thanks for coming back. Thanks for coming back. And if you want to stay for some Bible study, feel free. Otherwise, uh, you know, just thanks for, you know, giving a thank you and showing some appreciation. That means a lot. I liked what you had going on over there, trying to support other Christian streamers and, you know, show <laughs> there's not many of us out there. So trying to show that you're not alone and that there's other people out there trying to uh, help out. I got to play some lethal company with another streamer friend tonight, but I'll be working and listening. Nice, man. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for coming by. Hopefully lethal company goes well, and uh, hopefully you'll get some little knowledge bits in the background. Two chapters in a short stream. Actually, it's more than two streams because we're doing the end of chapter 15, all of chapter 16, and all of chapter 17. Um, the good thing is that these four stories are really all interconnected, so I'm going to play on uh, all of their conjoined meaning together. That's how it's going to work. But I'm going to stick around for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I'll pray us in here now that we've had some some time for people to pour in, and then I'll talk about how we're going to do this. So uh, if you'll join me in prayer real quick. My Father in heaven, thank you so much for today. Thank you for gathering all of us here to be able to dive into your word and to learn something new. Um, I pray that you will meet us here in this conversation, that you will speak through me and speak through all of us here so that we all might learn something new, that we might have a very productive conversation, um, that we just have a fantastic time in fellowship together, uh, learning your word and growing closer to you. Um, thank you so much for uh, giving me time to be able to do this. I know it's a very cramped week with my intensive class and a little tired and I've got a paper to go right after this. Um, but. You know, just thank you so much for the time that we have to be able to do this anyways. Um, I pray that this time is fruitful, um, that I say all the things that are honoring unto you. And I pray that this will be a place where your kingdom is furthered on this earth. And I thank you so much for all of these things. And for everybody who is here to bless my night. Hopefully we are a blessing to them as well. For all these things in your name, amen. amen. So, let me, I'll swap over here to our passage. Um, so I got the Logos software pulled up here. We're going to be starting here in Exodus chapter 15, verse 21, um, or sorry, verse 22. So, um, if you're new here, we have been going through, uh, the Bible. We started in Genesis last year. We went through all of Genesis and now we are in the book of Exodus. So we're going through, um, we had just gotten out of Egypt. So all of the Israelites, they got out of Egypt and they just crossed the red sea that was actually where we just left off uh just the last time we did bible study last or two wednesdays ago since last wednesday we watched the movie um so we ended off that was the red sea incident where they crossed over the red sea uh pharaoh's army was drowned and then there's the song that moses leads the israelites into uh to celebrate uh god saving them from the egyptian slavery and saving them from pharaoh's army um, but just before chapter 16 starts, we get a little start story here um, that we're going to read through. Um, if you have your own physical Bible on you, I encourage you to pull that up and read along with us. Um, mostly so that you can have it on you because like this is a longer portion. We're going all the way from here to all the way down here. <laughs> so we got a little ways to go. So if you have your own physical copy on you, you can flip around and, you know, look for different things that have been said and... Uh, go along your own lines if you want to, but also if you have a different English translation or if English is not your primary language and you speak primarily in a different language, you can pull that up uh, because translation is a bit of an art. And that is why we have so many different English translations of the Bible is because there's not one clear way to do it. Um, that means that we come up with different ways of translating things that both can be interpreted as accurate. Um, so if you have a different translation that you want to read alongside of us and something is translated slightly differently, we can go back to the original Hebrew and we can determine why something is translated different. Uh, so on this Logos software tool, I can do word studies on specific words. Um, let's just do wilderness. So if I do this, um, we get, you know, a bunch of background on the wilderness in this book and how it is used throughout the rest of the Bible. But also we can do a little bit of a Hebrew word search. If we go back here, uh, we can go back to the Greek word and the Hebrew words that are used, go back to the original language and try to figure out things that way. Um, if you want to go into why something is translated one way versus another, uh, we can go ahead and do that. And that'd be super awesome for us to go do. 
Um, otherwise, we're going to do this Bible study uh, in a couple different segments. So the way that we're going to start this Bible study is just reading through the passage at face value. So we're going to start here in Exodus chapter 15, verse 22, and we're going to read all the way through the end of chapter 17. We're just going to read through the passage straight at face value. Essentially, we do this so that we can have God speak to us on his own terms and teach us what it is that he wants to teach us. After we've read through the passage one time, we're going to go back through the passage, and this time we're going to make observations and notes here and there. Um, we say questions, comments, and concerns. If you have any questions about the passage and what's going on, or who a certain person is, or what's going on, uh, we'll try to answer that together. I might not have the answer, but somebody else here might, or we can try and look into it together. Um, if there's any comments that you want to make, anything that sticks out to you, anything that maybe the rest of us didn't see, we'd love to hear it. Um, or if there's anything that concerns you about the passage, anything that stands out to you as slightly concerning, like, why is that in the Word of God? We can talk about that. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to get caught up on chat here real quick. Um, Cole is going to go make food. Okay, sweet. <laughs> well, uh, he'll be back in just a minute, and he'll probably be back by the time we get done reading through the passage. So if you want to read along with me, I'll have it here pulled up on the screen, or if you have your own physical copy. I'm going to start reading here in verse 22 of Exodus chapter 15, and we're going to read the whole way through to the end of chapter 17. So if you'll join me. Then Moses ordered Israel to set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. That is why it is called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? He cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he put them to the test. He said, If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give heed to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to a limb, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they camped there by the water. Here in chapter 16, the whole congregation of the Israelites set out from a limb, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between a limb and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare for what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and, fill, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, an omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, they, those who gathered much, had nothing over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed, and Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul. 
and Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, and much as much as each needed, but when the sun grew hot it melted. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much food, two omers apiece. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake, and boil what you need to boil. And all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until morning, as Moses commanded them, and it did not become foul, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, and they found none. The Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you food for two days. Each of you stay where you are. Do not leave your place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. The house of Israel called it manna. It was like coriander seed white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations, in order that they may see the food with which I fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar, and put an omer of manna in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the covenant, for safekeeping. The Israelites ate manna forty years until they came to a habitable land, and they ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan, and Omer is a tenth of an epith. <laughs> and then chapter 17, this one's shorter. From the wilderness of Sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go out, go on ahead of the people, and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so, in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some men for us and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him, and fought with Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill, whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew very weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other side, so his hands were steady until the sunset. And Joshua defeated Amalek, Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a reminder in a book, and recite it in the hearing of Joshua. I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, A Lord upon the banner of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So, that is our longer passage. Um, I'm going to do my typical thing, and I'm going to ask you guys... Comments, questions, concerns. Are there any questions that you guys have about the passage and anything that we just read? Any questions about who any people are? About where any of this is taking place? About anything in general? Are there any comments that you want to make? Anything that stands out to you? Uh, and concerns. Anything that concerns you as well. And I'm going to ask a fourth question this time, unique to our passage today. What is the common theme among all four of these stories? You don't have to answer that question now. But keep it in mind, because as I'm reading through these passages again, there is going to be a common theme that emerges that is why we're doing all four of these stories today. There's one theme, one application from all four of these stories that I'll have you guys guess. And maybe you'll guess it right away, and we'll <laughs> we'll talk about it right away, or maybe you guys will be guessing for a little while. I'll, uh, we'll see what happens. He just added sugar. 
<laughs> Possible. It's a problem if I was missing and late? No, man, absolutely not. We're just getting started. We just read through the passage, and now we're going to be talking about the passage more in depth, and then we're going to, uh, you know, keep going. The rock you struck, I heard there is a well there now. I know not if that is true. That would be something that Altus would be able to answer. If only Altus was here tonight, or Aristotle. If Aristotle or Altus were here tonight, I know that those two would be able to answer that question. Jews complain God provides. It's a little deeper than that. It's a little deeper than that, but yeah, that's 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 a big part of it. <laughs> that's about 90% of it. <laughs> There's a little bit, there's a little extra nuance to it, but yeah, that's about 90% of it. So Cole kind of hit it on the head right off the bat. Um, all four of these stories have to do with um, God providing for the Israelite people in a unique way, right? Um, and I'll, I'll go in more into detail about that as we keep going. But uh, yeah, so... We'll, we'll, we'll keep coming back to that theme of God's provision and the Israelites complaining. But uh, I guess we can get started going back through. So, we as, as we were talking about, we left off at the Red Sea incident. So the last time we saw the Israelites, the last time we talked about this, uh, the Israelites had just come out of Egypt, and they were coming through the wilderness, and they ended up at the Red Sea, and, you know... The Red Sea split, uh, you know, the winds came and there was this big scene and the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea because the water was split and then the water came back down and swallowed Pharaoh's army. So, you know, this is after that, right? So Moses ordered the Israelites to set up from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. All right, so if like we go back to our map here, right? So let's zoom out. Go back to our handy dandy map of the exodus of egypt right so here is you know europe right so here's italy or modern day europe with italy and greece and turkey and whatnot uh, all of these places are of course named after the places back when they would have been here during the exodus from egypt and here is the outline of modern egypt and here's the nile uh, modern day egypt is in the same place as ancient day egypt <laughs> surprise surprise so here is the nile river and where is Goshen? I know. Or maybe Goshen's not on this map. Goshen might not be one of the areas that we know where it exists. But anyways, we know that the Israelites took off from Sakath, right? So Sakath is where we hear about the Israelites taking off from to, to go out of Egypt, right? And the Red Sea is this larger body of water that comes through here, right? So there is this kind of peninsula outreach. I think this is technically a peninsula. I'm not sure, but there's like, this is the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and this is going out to the Indian Sea down here, right? Um, so there's this little outcrop here. So we got the Red Sea here, right? So the Israelites take off from Sakath. Um, I think we said Goshen was somewhere around here, even though it's not popping up on this map. But Goshen was the place where the Israelites dwelled from the time of Jacob, right? So they take off from Sakath and they cross the Red Sea at one point that we don't know. <laughs> so you see these areas here, Pi Hiroth with a question mark, and then here it is again, and here it is again. That's because this is all technically the Red Sea. And we don't know exactly where the Israelites crossed over because we don't know where Pi Hiroth is. Like these ones here, these ones are in bold letters, meaning this is a town, this is a town or a city that we have excavated in the modern day and we know its ancient location. These ones that are kind of grayed out, these ones are ones that we are a lot less sure of, right? So they take off from Sakath. And they cross the Red Sea at one of these three locations. We're unsure of which one. And they are going to take off into the wilderness of Shur. Which, I'm not sure if that one actually shows up on this map. Shur might not be a place that we know of. But here's Mara. Which Mara is the place that we talk about here. So... 
and they went into the wilderness of Shur. So I think this is my seminary student coming in, but don't quote me on this because I could be wrong. I want to say this whole region is the wilderness of Shur, and that's why it's not labeled. I want to say. Don't quote me on that, though. That's something I'm not 100% sure of. But I want to say this is all the wilderness of Shur. I could be wrong on that, though. So they take off some from Sakoth here. They cross the Red Sea at one of these three spots, and they're coming down here. Why are they coming down here? Well, because this is occupied region by, you know, Egyptians and Philistines up here. And we heard a couple chapters ago that God took them a roundabout way Right, so if we go back up to before the Red Sea incident, we have a quote where it says that God, um, where was it? Yeah, here we go. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was nearer. For God thought if the people faced war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by a roundabout way of the wilderness towards the Red Sea, right? So this is more land of the Philistines, uh, and then this is also the land of Canaan, which Egypt is currently partially occupying. So God is leading them around the people, because this is modern day Israel, right? This is the land of Canaan where they are going to be going back towards, but they aren't going to go through here because this is Philistine territory and God doesn't want to lead them into combat. So I believe this is the wilderness of Shur. God is leading them from Sakoth across the Red Sea, down to the wilderness of Shur, and here is Mara, where this story takes place. Um, so going back down to our passage. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Mara, which is the place I just pointed out, they could not drink the water at Mara because it was bitter. This is why it is called Mara. I'm assuming if I look this up that Mara means bitter in the Hebrew. Um, there is no definition for it. <laughs> when they came to Mara, they could not drink the water of Mara because it was bitter. Huh. Well, this is all the times that it's listed. Just our passage today. And then there's two times it's mentioned in the book of Numbers. They went three days before the noise and the of Ethan. So Mara. Interesting. Okay. That's interesting to know. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Roundabout thing. Uh, this is why it's called Mara. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Moses then cries out to the Lord, and the Lord shows him a piece of wood. He throws it into the water, and the wood, be the water became sweet. And Coles was saying that this is maybe sugar. Which, I mean, hey, it's possible. It could be sugar. There the Lord made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he put them to the test. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do not and do what is right in his sight and give heed to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Right, because we know our God is a God who is merciful, slow to anger. And the Israelites knew this as well. And this is why it is stated, I am the God who heals you. He is a redeemer God. He is a God who restores in the same way, he has restored Israel back, and he is going to continue to restore Israel back. And he even gave multiple chances to Pharaoh, as we talked about in the last couple sections. You know, God, you know, made it very clear that Moses, that Pharaoh could have let the Israelites go from their slavery with no plagues or no death and nothing that goes wrong. And Pharaoh continually insisted ten times over that the Israelites could not go even after 10 plagues kept coming through over and over and over every single time Pharaoh said no, right? And there's a little bit of foreshadowing here, <laughs> a little bit of foreshadowing to the future in that um, the Israelites will not in the future, this is far future, this is not near future, this is, this is far, far future, but the Israelites will not give heed to his commandments and statutes, and they will go off and do their own things. They will do what is pleasing in their own eyes, as the book of Judges would say. And God will lead them into slavery again, into other nations. But this is this is far foreshadowed. This is far foreshadowed. We don't have to worry about that anytime soon in our current study. <laughs> um, but then they came to a limb where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And they camped there by the water. 
I'm assuming that a limb is not a place that is going to be on the map. Probably not. But they're going down here. This is Mara. Uh, well, it's grayed out, so it's assumed this is Mara, but it's not entirely sure. They're going to keep coming down here. Uh, a limb was probably somewhere in here because this is Maraba, which is the other place on our list today. And this is Mount Sinai. Uh, well, this is also grayed out, so potentially Mount Sinai is here. This is Maraba. And then this is Mara. So they're going, we're going down way south here to Mount Sinai. So, as Cole just, as we were just saying, right? Common theme. The Israelites complain to God about some need that they have. This one being water. Obviously, people need water to live. The Israelites are complaining that they don't have water. They complain to Moses. Moses goes to God. God provides water for them and water in abundance. He provides not only water for them right there, but then he also provides water with 12 springs whenever they get to a limb. Then we get to our longest story of the day, bread from heaven. So we're gonna soar through this one. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from a limb and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between a limb and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, Right, so this is almost two months in to leaving Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron. Right, so they're not complaining against God, just like they didn't up here in this past story. They're just not complaining against God again in this passage. They're complaining against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites say to Moses and Aaron, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate out our full fill of bread, for you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So they're complaining again, right? Cycle, cycle repeats. A couple months in, Israelites are complaining again. This time it's because they are in a lack of food. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against him. For what are we that you complain against us? Right? So Moses is, is saying to the Israelites, he's like, Why complain to me? Right? God is the one who brought you out of Egypt. God's the one who sent the ten plagues. God's the one who's drowned Pharaoh's army. And now God is the one who is leading you here in the wilderness through the pillar of fire and cloud, right? So there's the pillar of cloud that guides them during the day and the pillar of fire that guides them through the night. And that's how they get through the wilderness and know where God wants them to go, right? We heard about that right at the Red Sea incident. So God is the one who's leading them. God's the one who saved them. Moses is just the guy that God is speaking through. So Moses is like, yo, don't shoot the messenger. God's the one who did this, and God's the one who's going to provide for you. You know, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard your complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness. And uh, if you guys don't know, Aaron is Moses' brother, older brother. Um, even though Moses is the one that God is, you know, choosing to lead the people, Aaron is going to be the representative for the, the future priests. Um, and as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Right, so this is the cloud that's guiding them through the wilderness. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall have meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So in the evening, quails, so, so birds for meat, birds came and covered their whole camp, and they were able to take the birds and eat them for meat. And not only did they get meat in the evening, but in the morning, whenever they woke up, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance as if frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs. And Omer, 
to a person according to the to the number of persons all providing for their uh, those in their own tents so an omer what is an omer let's do a study so obviously it's some form of measurement system i don't remember what it is to be honest i think it might not be something that's known a unit of measure equal to one tenth of an afa used by the Izzoites to ration men in the wilderness for third yeah let's do weights and measurements i know i've studied this in the past but i honestly don't remember <laughs> I honestly don't remember what how what how big it is. Um. Oh gosh, this is it. Weights and measurements: an overview of units of weight and measurement in the Bible. Huh. Gilmed. Cubit. Okay, so these are Becca, Gara, Pim. Uh, we're going here. Capacity. Here we go. Epha. The epha, the, a measure of grain, is one of the most common dry measurements in the Old Testament. It is used to measure a myriad of dry goods, including flour, grain, and barley. According to Ezekiel, the capacity of the epha is equal to the capacity of the liquid measurement bath each equivalent to one tenth homer, which in turn equates to three eighths to two thirds of a bushel. Okay, so there we go. And then the other, and then this is one tenth of that. That doesn't really help me too much, but anyways, <laughs> we tried. <laughs> um, it's not really too important. I was just curious. Um, so, so God, in this passage is not only providing so essentially in this passage god is providing food right so in our last passage god provided water for his people who were in need of water now in this passage he's providing food i know it says bread from heaven but he's not only providing bread but he's also providing meat because the birds come in the evening and the bread comes in the morning um and they just have to go out and gather it and eat it it's easy Right? They don't have to plant anything or gather. Or, well, I mean, have to, they have to gather, but they don't have to hunt or go searching. It's just already there. right? So God is like really providing for his people. So the same cycle repeats. God's people complain about something that they are in need of, and then God provides for them said thing. Um, but in this instance with the bread... God tests the Israelites to see if they will actually follow his instruction or not. And in the way that he does this is he tries to set an example for the Sabbath, right? So the Sabbath is to take the seventh day to keep it holy, right? So the Israelites and Christians to this day, right? We still practice this custom of working six days of the week and then taking one day to rest, right? So not just rest from our job, but rest from everything. We should not do anything that constitutes labor on the Sabbath, including going out and gathering food, right? We prepare that the day beforehand so that it can be ready on, on the, the Sabbath, right? So we're not going out and, you know, doing a bunch of work to get food, right? But the Israelites, they don't listen. And not only do they not listen once, they don't listen twice. Because God says... Do not gather more than one day's worth of food in any given day, right? You have one day, gather all the food for that day, and then be done with it, and then wait till the next day and gather the food that you need for that day and so on. Don't have an excess of the food. But they don't listen. They keep some left over until the next day, and whenever they do, it breadworms, becomes foul, and Moses becomes angry with them. But eventually they learn. And morning by morning, they gathered as much as they needed, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. So the Israelites, they don't, listen, they don't listen to God's command here by, you know, taking more than they need each day. But then whenever the Sabbath came around, they didn't listen again, right? So the sixth day comes around and they had gathered twice as much food, two omers apiece instead of a one. When all the leaders of the congregation came to Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake, and boil what you need to boil, and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. 
So they put it aside until morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not become foul like it did on the other days. And there were no worms in it, it did not become foul. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. And here's where the people don't listen for the second time. So they didn't listen the first time by gathering too much excess on normal days. But then on the Sabbath, they don't listen again because they go out to gather even more and they find that there's none there. Why is there none there? Because God didn't send any on the Sabbath because he expected the people to do what he said, which is gather twice as much the day beforehand so they don't go out and gather and work on the Sabbath day. Right? So here we say, The Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath, the day for rest. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you food for two days. Each of you stay where you are. Do not leave your place on the seventh day. So, eventually, just like the people learned to not gather more than they need on normal days, they also learned their lesson and did not take, they did not go out to gather on the Sabbath. But the, that's to show the people did not listen to God twice. <laughs> not, not only did they complain to God that they didn't have enough food, but then they also didn't listen to his instructions twice. In two different ways, they didn't follow his instructions about the food. The house of Israel called it manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and it had the taste like wafers made with honey. And then, just like the Passover, they, God says for the Israelites to put in motion a way for God to remember, or for the Israelites to remember how God provided for them, right? So God commanded the Israelites to practice the Passover so that the Israelites would remember how God saved them from slavery in Egypt and so that they wouldn't forget what God did for them. In the same way, that's what this paragraph is about. God is reminding the Israelites of how he, or essentially by the Israelites gathering some of this manna and putting it in a jar, they are constantly reminded of how when they finally get to the land of Canaan, when they finally don't need to live off of this manna anymore, they'll be reminded by this jar of manna that God provided for them while they were in the wilderness and they were hungry, right? So this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an own omer of it be kept throughout your generations in order that they may see the food with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said, take, said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the covenant for safekeeping. And then uh, here's a little bit of future telling. It says the Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a habitable land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. So this is kind of spoiling the future of the book apparently the uh apparently god didn't get the memo when he wrote the book of exodus and he put a spoiler in the the book way ahead of time but uh you know this isn't going to be this isn't going to actually happen until like 20 30 chapters from now whenever the Israelites disobey God and God sends them to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years before they're allowed to actually enter the land of Canaan. But that's going to happen way longer from now. They still got to get to Sinai and do all that extra stuff. But uh, I guess God didn't get the memo and he put a spoiler in here in chapter 16 ahead of time. So uh, yeah, that's a uh, sorry about the, the spoiler. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that, that's what this is talking about here, essentially. Um, even though they have only been in the wilderness for, I'm assuming, I mean, it's said that they have been out for, what, two months and 15 days, something like that at the beginning of this story. So they've been out for like two, maybe three months, right? Not 40 years. <laughs> this is, uh, this is telling about what will happen. So it's essentially saying, you know, this manna that God provided for them on the 15th day of the second month, this is going to be the food that they ate for the next 40 years while they're out in the wilderness. Um, just to clarify for any future readers, right? So then we come to our third story. Water from the rock. God is providing again, right? So then we're going to have the same cycle repeat that Cole pointed out earlier, right? Israelites are going to complain that they don't have something, and God's going to provide for their need. And this time it is water again for the second time. So it was water the first time, then bread, now it's water again. 
From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. Um, essentially, this is to say they 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 went through the wilderness according to their tribe, right? So this tribe went out first, and the next tribe was after them, and the next tribe was after them, and they went out in stages, which is their tribes, and they went out into the wilderness in this line, right? And when they did, they camped at Rephidim. I don't think this place was on the map. So they came from Mara down here in the wilderness. They come to Meribah, which is our story for today. Um, and they're going to be at Mount Sinai. So no, that place isn't on here either. A lot of these places, we don't know where they are. Just because it's so old. It's so old, we don't know where a lot of these places are. But, uh, you know, we get the general idea. We have, we have just enough information, you know, with Mar Meribah and Mount Sinai and Mara and stuff like that. We have just enough information to trace their line. So they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Mer Massa and Meribah. Because Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? I just realized there's a chiasm here. I don't know how I didn't see this earlier, but there's a chiasm here. Uh, if Aristotle was here, he would absolutely point this out. Okay, so if you don't know what a chiasm is, it is a poetic and narrative storytelling device. Um, gosh, how can I explain this, right? So, you know in poetry there's like A1 and A2. Right, line A1 rhymes with A2, and then there's B1 and B2, right? line B1 rhymes with B2, and so on. A chiasm is whenever they go in a cone, right? So the first story and the last story are A1 and A2. And then there's B1 and B2, which is the second event and the second to last event. And then, just for the sake of the argument, C will be in the middle, and it'll be the top of the story. Right. I realize that there is a chiasm here. I don't know how I didn't see this before. But so there's this cycle, right? It starts off. Uh, the Israelites are in this area. And there's a problem. They complain to Moses about said problem. Moses goes to God. Then God provides a way out for the Israelites. And the Israelites celebrate. And it's not just our four stories today that have this. This is why I didn't see the chiasm. If you if we'll go back to the Red Sea account, if we'll go back to the Red Sea account, it starts off the exact same way. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in Pi Hirath between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Paizan. You shall camp opposite it by the sea. And then there's this thing with Pharaoh. And then there's uh, Pharaoh coming out and pursuing them. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us out into the wilderness to die? Right? So it's the exact same thing. Right? The Israelites are presented with a problem. Then they cry out to Moses in complaint. And they even say what they say in these next four stories. They say, were there no graves in Egypt for you to take? And, and did you just take us out here to die? Right? And then Moses goes to God. Or I guess in this situation, God comes to Moses. Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward, pick up your staff, and stretch it out over the sea and divide it so that they can cross over. So here's the chiasm. Right? In the first story, A1. This is, this is A1. Right? So there's five stories since the Israelites got out into the wilderness. Right? So the, the Israelites leave Egypt. 
This is the first story, Crossing the Red Sea. In both A1 and A2, God provides for the Israelites against a military conqueror, right? So the very first story is God providing against Pharaoh's army. In the very last story, God is providing against Amalek's army. Then the second story and the second to last story are God providing water. God provides water at Mara in the second story. And then in the fourth story, God provides water at Meribah. And then in the middle story, C, God provides food, right? So the order at the end with these five stories of God providing for the Israelites, it goes uh, salvation from or provision against an enemy, provision of water, provision of food, provision of water, and provision against an army. It's a chiasm. Oh, I can't believe I didn't realize that before. I'm so obsessed with my, at myself. How many times? How many times did I read this passage and I didn't? Oh, I read this passage so many times I didn't realize that was a chiasm. I can't believe I didn't notice that. Altus would be ashamed at me. But yeah, so so there's two stories God provides against a foreign enemy. First story, last story. Then he provides water in the second and fourth story, and then he provides food in the middle story. That's pretty cool. I didn't notice that before. Um. But yeah, sorry, sad tangent aside. Cole, I came across a problem. I am low on tea. What kind of tea do you drink? I don't know you drank tea. I don't know what kind of tea you drink now. Do you drink tea out of the rock at Meribah? You know? <laughs> drink tea from the water at the well at Meribah. But yeah, so so anyways, our, our last little story here. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, and this is our first mention of Joshua. I don't think we've had Joshua mentioned yet. I believe this is our first mention of Joshua. Joshua is a very important person. Um, this is our first mention of him. But essentially, Joshua is going to be one of the 12 spies later on. And Joshua is going to be Moses' successor. Right? So after Moses dies, Joshua is going to be the one that takes charge and leads the Israelites. He's going to be the one that God calls to lead the Israelites. Um, he's going to be one of the 12 spies that goes into the land of Canaan. Um, so this is our first mention of Joshua, I'm pretty sure. Um, Cole, twinning Irish breakfast with scoops of sugar. Three scoops of sugar, to be specific. That's a good choice. That's a very good choice. <laughs> So Amalek and his army came out, and they go to fight. Moses says to Joshua, our first mention of Joshua, Choose some men for us and go out. Fight with Am Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. The same staff that brought about the ten plagues in Egypt, and the same staff that turned into the snake, the same snake that did all the, and the same snake, or the same staff that split the Red Sea. Right? So this is the staff that God... Gave, gave to Moses and God, God was like, listen, you're going to use this staff to turn it into a snake and you're going to use it to bring about the 10 plagues and you're going to use it to split the Red Sea. And it's still the way that God is providing for his people through Moses. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed, right? So, so Moses, Moses is up on the hill. Here, here's how I picture this scene. Here's how I picture this scene. I picture Moses like a Tuscan raider up on the hill. He's like, oh, he's got the staff in his hand. And whenever he has the staff in his hand, he <laughs> is really its win. And then whenever his arms get tired and the staff comes down, they start losing. And then they, they got to put up his hands again. I mean, they are out in the desert. So, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know. Oh, well. It's just a weird picture. That I uh, that that you know I had in my head, and now all of you have to have in your heads now too. Just a weird picture I had in my head that you guys have to have in your head now too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as Moses' hands grow weary, uh, so Joshua and well, I guess it's Aaron and her, they go up and they put a stone under Moses so that he can sit on it. And then his arms are still tired, so Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other side, so that his hands were steady until the sunset. 
and Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a reminder in, the, in a book and recite it in the hearing of Joshua. I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He set a hand upon the banner of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Um, which is interesting. Uh, write this as a reminder in a book and recite it in the hearing of Joshua so that I can blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Which is funny because, like, like probably the only record that we have of Amalek in all of history is the Bible. So it's a little bit ironic. Yeah, the area roamed by the nomadic Amalekites from the West Sinai to Arabia. It's like, yeah, we have, like, so few mention of Amalek. Like... If, if there was mention of Amalek, like, outside the Bible, it would be here. Which it looks like there is a little bit of mention here. But probably, like, some of the only reference we have of Amalek is here in the Bible. So it's a little bit ironic. It's like, I will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven so that no people will ever remember Amalek. But also, put him in this book so that you guys can remember him forever. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit funny. But, um, yeah. So that's our passage for the week. Um, four little stories that are four stories in a big chiasm that I didn't realize until before. Um, next week we're going to get into chapter 17, or chapter 18, sorry. Um, but, yeah. So, what do we learn today? What do we learn today? We learned a little bit more about Israel's early relations with Moses and with God. Um, the Israelites don't have the greatest relationship with God. Um, I talked about this in a previous week, but um, the Israelites, it's hard, right? We, as readers of this Bible in the present day, we have the gift of hindsight to know how things went. I gave favor to the Israelites early on in saying they were probably right to deny Moses originally because we would have probably done the same thing. If we saw some dude like Moses show up and make things worse for us, it would probably make sense for us to complain and say that Moses isn't, you know, really sent by God and God's not really going to come save us. Then the 10 plagues come through and they're at the Red Sea and the Israelites complain saying that God is not going to provide for them and they complain against Moses. That was whenever I started to give the Israelites not so much leniency anymore. Because this time they'd actually seen God do wondrous works in the land of Egypt. This time they'd actually seen God doing things. They saw him do ten plagues, and they saw God lead them out of Egypt by a pillar of fire in the sky. And as the pillar of fire is in the sky in front of them, they complain against God and against Moses, and they say, so much better for us to have died Egypt. And at that point, I said the Israelites don't have so much reason to complain against God any longer. It's a little tough again, though, right? I can imagine if you or I went without water for three days, right? If you remember here at end of chapter 15, they sent out from the Red Sea and they went in the wilderness of Shur and they went three days with no water. If you or I went three days without water, we'd be, you know, not doing so great. <laughs> three days without water is really extreme. That's that's borderline death territory. <laughs> um, so, in a sense, the Israelites probably have reason to complain. Right? And here's why I'm saying this, right? We have the gift of hindsight to see, oh yeah, why would the Israelites complain? Of course God's going to provide for them. Of course he's going to give them water. Of course he's going to give them food. Of course he's going to protect them against these armies, right? Because we have the gift of hindsight. If we were in these situations, I know that many of us would do the exact same things. I know that many of us would complain about not having water after three days. I know that many of us would complain after not having been able to find good food for two and a half months. I know that we would be complaining if we were on the brink of death by Pharaoh's army. That being said, it's something that we can learn is 
even in our moments of great fear, even in our need, times of great need and want, we can have faith that God will provide for us because we have the biblical example. Would it be hard not to complain in our situations? Sure. But it's stories like this that remind us that God will get us through to the next day. I don't know what situations you all are going through. I don't know all the hardships that you guys are facing. But I can imagine that whatever it is, poverty or relationship troubles or friendship problems or sickness or whatever it is, that you've probably gone to God in prayer about it. I don't know what attitude you've had when you've gone to God in prayer about it. Obviously, there's different ways that you can complain about something to God, right? If I'm in poverty, I can pray to God and I can ask him to provide for my needs. And I can do so in a good way by asking, or I can do so in a way of complaining and saying, why would you let us out here to die? Why would you lead us to the brink of death? Why would you do this to me, God, right? There's, there's a good way to ask for food, you know, Heavenly Father, provide for me my daily, as, as Jesus would say, right? Father in heaven, how would be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, right? So in that sense, we can ask God for our needs. It's okay to go before God in the midst of your troubles and ask for healing. It's okay to go, to go, go before God and ask him for help out of your poverty or whatever it is that you're going through. That's not complaining. That's not doing what the Israelites were doing. There's a difference between asking your heavenly heavenly father what it is that you need and asking him for, to provide for it. And there's a difference between that and complaining. The Israelites were complaining. The Israelites were crying out to God and accusing him of things. Why would you do this? Why would you let us suffer? Better for us to have been dead. That's not humbly coming before our Heavenly Father and asking Him to provide for our needs. That we can do. After all, after all, God in Heaven is our Father. And in the same way your earthly father would want to know the things that are on your heart, the things that are on your mind, and in the same way that your earthly father would want to provide for your needs, how much more, how much more would our Heavenly Father in Heaven want to provide for our needs? After all, the New Testament will say, why worry for tomorrow and its needs when you know that God will provide for you? If God will provide for the sparrows in the field, how much more will he provide for his son or his daughter? This is not to say that things will be great. After all, we are also promised hardship in this life. But we will know that our needs will be met. Even though we might ha have an easy life in this world, we can know that God will meet our needs. God will feed us. God will give us water. God will protect us from harm. Just as he did for the Israelites. This is not a prosperity gospel message. This is not to say that God will give you millions of dollars and make your life very comfortable. This is not to say that God will cure you of any disabilities or any illnesses. That isn't promise. What is promised is that your needs will be met. As God provides for the Israelites, and as God provides for the sparrow of the field, so too will God provide for you and me. And that's what we should remember this week. That's what I hope each and every single one of us takes away from this week is that whatever it is situation that is going on in your life, whatever it is that you have going on, whatever hardships are in your road, whatever it is, take it to God. Don't complain about it like the Israelites did. Don't cry out. Well, maybe you can cry out. Just don't cry out in the way that the Israelites did. Don't cry out to the God in the way that the Israelites did. Do not complain to God. Humbly come before your Heavenly Father with your needs. After all, he wants to know them. And after all, 
I guess that'll be our new weekly challenge. Our new weekly challenge will be to remember that God provides for our every need and to go before God humbly in prayer about these requests. But that's all I have for our Bible study this week. I know it's a little bit shorter. I'm a little bit over actually. I was hoping to get done in an hour, um, but I can't leave you guys hanging. Um, real quick, before we keep going, we've got our weekly challenge. Um, I'm gonna put that in the Discord whenever I get the chance here, um, so that you guys can remember our new challenge going forward that we're gonna be doing. Uh, I will be doing it myself, and I pray that you guys will do it with me. Uh, this weekly challenge that we do as a community is a way that we can better ourselves and we can better the world around us in small little ways every single week. And I pray that you will join us in doing so. Um, but I'll put that in the Discord whenever I get the chance um, so that you guys can follow along. Remember, uh, just essentially, it's really easy. Just whatever situation that is that you are going through, whatever hardships it is that you're facing, remember that God will provide for your needs. Um, and speaking of needs, we have prayer requests in our Discord, um, and we are a community that believes in the power of prayer. Um, so I am going to go through our Discord and go through all of the prayer requests that we have uh, so that you guys can be praying for them. So as I go through our Discord and as I go through all the prayer requests that are on our list, uh, feel free to be praying for them as I say them, or keep some of them in your mind as the week goes on so that you can remember to be praying for them uh, as the week goes on. Um, but I'm going to start out here with Evan. Um, so Evan is a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine back from home. Uh, he helped start this channel with me and my friends, um, and he's been dealing with a medical condition at the moment, um, and he really needs a lot of prayer right now. Um, so please be praying for Evan during this hard time. Um, we have a prayer for the special medic. Uh, two prayer requests for him. First of all, we have a prayer request for his missions trip that's been, that is coming up. Uh, we're praying for him that he might be able to receive all of the money that he needs to be able to go on that trip. Um, that will, God will provide for all of the money that is needed for him to be able to go and help out in the world. Um, and we also have a prayer request for a friend of his who has been dealing with a medical condition at the moment. Um, we have uh, so a couple praises from Cole. Uh, prayer praises that his family has been doing uh, a lot better recently. We had some prayer requests for his mom and for his sister, so praises for that, but also some praises for uh, some situations going on with him in school. Uh, Cole was having some uh, issues with schooling and things that were going on uh, with his college, um, and a praise that that seems to have been mostly resolved. Um, we also have, um, what's the next one? I gotta scroll through quite a bit. A lot of these have been answered already, so I gotta scroll through the ones that have been answered um, and get to the ones that still need prayer. Um, we have another praise, actually. A praise for our, from Lavender Snorlax. Uh, she was asking for prayer for a little while about... Um, she was asking for some prayer because she was trying to get a car so that she could drive to her teaching placement. Um, so just a praise for her that she was able to actually get to her teaching placement and that she was able to um, actually do all of that last semester. Um, a prayer request um, from Zev. Uh, one of his friends unfortunately had a father that passed away recently, so prayer for all of their family. Um, prayer for Ta Gray. Um, he had a couple friends of his recently that were in attendance at the Oklahoma State Fair where there was an active shooter just a couple months ago. Uh, prayer for them and their families with any trauma that might still be there. A um, couple prayer requests from Thomas uh, from his, for his mom and also for his grandma. Um, both of them dealing with individual medical conditions. Uh, his mom's been struggling with bad breathing problems and his grandma's been dealing with handful of medical problems, including memory loss and cardiac issues. Um, so prayer for uh, Thomas and for his family. Um, we have, uh, gosh, a lot of these have been answered. <laughs> so praise for a lot of answered prayer requests. Uh, we have a prayer request from Emma. Uh, Emma has been dealing with her battle against cancer for some time now. Um, I'll read off a prayer request. It says, I've had Hodgkin's lymphoma for quite a few years and it's affecting my ability to breathe at times. Prayer for wisdom on how to fight it and that all begin to improve would be greatly appreciated. 
Um, so prayer requests for Emma and for their family as they go through all of this. Um, prayer from Leo. Uh, Leo is asking for prayer in school so he can, can be successful and go far in his career and also for his brother uh, who just had surgery so that he can heal from that. Um, her request from the Toxic family, um, I haven't gotten an update on this. Um, they had put in a prayer request back in November. They had gotten an eviction notice from their house. Last I heard, I think that got resolved. Uh, they said that things seemed to be working out was the last that I heard from them. So potentially continued prayer for them and their family. Um, a prayer request from 2Jug. Uh, two jug came by with an unspoken prayer request we don't know what it was um but just prayer for him and for whatever is going on there um another prayer request from zev zev has a roommate who uh has been struggling with rent uh because he lost a job um prayer for them uh last i heard i think that situation was a little bit better than it was before i believe he got a job um but things are still not in the greatest situation um Another prayer request from Lavender Snorlax, uh, the one that I was mentioning earlier about the teaching placement. She's asking for prayer uh, for some job interviews that she's been going to so that she might be able to hear back from some and potentially get a job soon. Um, prayer request from Samuel Soros. Samuel Soros is asking for prayer for his brother. Um, I'll just read off his prayer request. Uh, his brother is away from everything, the church, God. And he has already said that he does not believe in Jesus. So my request is that you pray for him. So we will be praying for Samuel Soros and for his brother, um, Kodo. Kodo has been speaking to someone who is not a Christian yet. And he's been asking for prayer in wisdom so that he might be able to speak well. The Holy Spirit might guide his words so that they might uh, come to have a saving faith. Um, prayer a crest for Grace and for her husband. Uh, some fellow streamers of friends of ours. Um, they just tested positive for the flu just a couple weeks ago, and I know that that's been pretty painful for them. <laughs> Hopefully they've been getting better from that. I know it's been lasting for a while for them. Um, also, prayer request from Zev again. I forgot about this one. Uh, Zev is asking for prayer because he's been on the onboarding process with Uversion to serve on their response team for the prayer requests that come in. Um, he's asking for prayers that God will be able to use him to help the people who bring in the prayer requests. Um, I know he's been doing that for them for a little bit now. Uh, for the past couple weeks, he's been helping out with the prayer requests that come in. Uh, so prayer that he's able to actually really help out the people who have those prayer requests. Um, also, prayer for a lot of the American nation right now, um, because it has been going through a massive cold spell, especially on the East Coast right now. Um, Zev put in right now that he is asking for prayer for his state because it's under a state of emergency. Um, there's been a ton of snowfall, super cold, negative temperatures in multiple states right now. Nate was saying the same thing in Arkansas. Um, there's a lot of store, there's a lot of states that are really struggling with this massive cold spell and emergency and stuff like that. Um, so prayer for all the people that are being affected by this massive cold spell. Um, but that is all the prayer requests that we have in the discord. Um, if you guys have any other prayer requests that you would like to add to the list, feel free to put it in the Discord uh, anytime you want or in the Twitch chat now, and we can know to be praying for them before I go into prayer with all of these requests. Um, and now let me get caught up in chat now that I can see it again. <laughs> uh, Ace, hello man, good to see you Ace, how's it going tonight? Good to see you, good to see that you're back here for a little bit of Bible study. Um, oh, and yeah, you don't seem to read the chat very much. Well. Explanation, uh, as you can see, I am not at my house. I am traveling right now and I don't have my full setup. All I have is a little laptop screen here. Um, and I can only have one screen pulled up at a time, <laughs> essentially. So either it's Discord or the stream or this or that. And since I was going through the prayer requests on the Discord, I wasn't able to see the chat. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but it's good to see you, man. Good to see you. I had a conversation with another streamer about Christianity. Dude, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. How long, Did you get to be here for any a bit of the Bible study, or did you come in right at the end? But it's good to see you, man. But yeah, if there's any other prayer requests, feel free to put them in now real quick before I go into prayer. And we will call it a night. But yeah, Ace, hopefully you were able to be here for a little bit of it at least before uh, we uh, ended.
<laughs> of a zev. A prayer request? Yeah, pray for me? Yeah, dude, absolutely. What are you asking for prayer for? You have anything in specific you're asking for prayer for, or just prayer in general for you? So I can pray by myself one day? Oh, yeah, I mean, absolutely, man. Um, you're saying like you just don't know how to, or you don't feel comfortable doing it, or how so? I can't do it and mean it in my heart. Well, a little word of encouragement. I know you've been going through uh, quite a few different religious texts recently and been studying a lot of different stuff. Uh, so I know that an Old Testament or biblical perspective might not mean too much to you right now. But if it's any word of encouragement, um, the Israelites and the Jews actually had um, a practice in place. And essentially it was um, a practice of going before the Lord even whenever their faith was lacking. Um, so essentially, the book of Psalms is a bunch of songs that the Israelites wrote to be sung in prayer, right? And fun fact, over half of the Psalms are songs of lament. Over half of the songs written to God in prayer in the book of Psalms are books of great sadness or great sorrow or great anger. And the reason for that is because the Israelites and the Jews saw it as an act of faith to go before God in prayer, even whenever they were doubting that God was there and listening. Even whenever the Israelites were doubting that their prayers were reaching God and that their prayers really meant anything, they found it as an act of faith to go before God in prayer anyways and to try their best. Um, and the New Testament would actually back that as well. Um, the New Testament would talk about praying to God that he would strengthen our faith. Where our faith is weak, we pray that God would strengthen our faith so that we would know that even whenever we have doubts about our prayers or doubts about a certain aspect of our faith or doubts about something that we're reading in the, the word of God, we ask for faith. We ask for God to strengthen our faith. Um, so really, prayer in a biblical sense is something that you just have to do. Whether you have, whether you really believe it means something or not, whether you're good at it or not, the Bible sees prayer as something that you do anyways. It's something that even if you aren't good at it, even if it's something that you don't know if it really means anything, you go before, in, you go before God in prayer anyways and you try your best. Even if you don't think God's listening, even if you don't really mean the things that you're saying, even if, you know, you don't really have faith at all. It's something that you do and eventually over time you get better at it. It's something that you become more comfortable with. It's something that you mean more when you do it. Um, and I know you're going through a bunch of different texts right now, but if you want a biblical perspective on it, that's a biblical perspective on prayer. A, big, a biblical perspective is that regardless of how you feel about your prayer, whether you think you mean it or not, or whether it's really good or not, you do it anyways. And to God, that's enough. Um, and if you're looking for a template for how to pray, uh, Jesus actually gives a template on how to pray. So let me pull that up real quick. Um, so this is the Lord's Prayer. Um, this is the prayer that Jesus offered. Um, oh gosh, it's not going to pull up right. Hang on a second. Let me pull it up in Logos. That might be easier. Um, let's see if I can do that. So this is the Lord's Prayer. Uh, this is essentially the template that God gave to, or that Jesus gave to Christians in the pray, right? So Jesus says, when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Um, different translation. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, the glory forever. Amen. Um, this is a different translation, but point being, um, this is the template for how to pray. Um, if you want a good know-how for it. But, but yeah, man, I'll be praying for you. And if you want, I'll put it in the Discord so that everybody can be praying for you. But um, just a word of encouragement, hopefully, before we get going here. Um, Hinduism, is the, Hinduism is the next on my list. Oh, I just went through a Hinduism spell, too. <laughs> I just had to study Hinduism last semester for a couple months back there. I read a lot of the Vedas and whatnot, so that was an interesting study. But uh, Hinduism is an interesting faith, that's for sure. The Vedas are very long, though. There is a lot of Vedas, so... Uh, <laughs> that's for sure. But, um, hey, if you guys will join me in prayer real quick. Father in heaven, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for gathering all of us here to be able to hear about your word and to gather closer to you. I pray that every single one of us here will learn something new about you tonight and about your word. I know that I learned something new. Um, and I pray that everybody else here did as well. Um, I pray that everyone here tonight was blessed by this conversation and that we can all go back out into the world to be able to serve you in new ways and to grow into closer relationship with you. I pray for all of the things that are going on in our lives, whatever it is. As we talked about today, you know, the Israelites struggled with no water in the wilderness and they struggled with having no food and they struggled as armies came against them to defeat them. And yet God still provided for their every need. And I pray that whatever it is that we're going through, whatever it is, poverty or illness or whatever it is that we're going through, I pray that we will come to you in prayer and we will ask that you support our needs. I pray that we will come to you as an act of faith, not in the way that the Israelites did, not in a way of complaining, not in a way like that, but I pray that we come before you humbly asking that you will meet our needs and having faith that you will provide for whatever it is that we are needing every single day. I pray that we will remember these things as we go into our week ahead and that we might grow closer to you every single day. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. But yeah, um, real quick before I get going, uh, Ace says longer than the Bible, I know. Yeah, the Vedas are, the Vedas are really long, man. But yeah, Ace, if you want to put that prayer request in the Discord, uh, feel free to do so. Um, we'd love to be praying for you as a community, and we'd love to help you out. You know, it's not just me who's here to help and discuss these type of things. We have a prayer team in our Discord, um, Kodo and Kali and Zev, and uh, I'm not sure who all is on it right now, but whoever is on the, the prayer team, you know, you can reach out to any of them and they will uh, help you if they're free. Um, that's why they're on the prayer team. They want to be able to pray for people and help them out. Um, but if you want to put in the, the prayer requests on our Discord as well, we can have the whole community be praying for you. Um, I know that I will be. Um, but no need for everyone to pray for me. Well, I mean, I, we're a community who believes in the power of prayer. Um, we believe in the power of prayer and we believe that it really means something. So we'd love to be praying for you. That's why we have the prayer request section in the first place, because people look at it and they want to be praying for the things that people need. Um, so if you want that, please feel free to put it in there and we'd love to be praying for you, man. But um, sorry, I, I'm, I really, I'm about half an hour late tonight. Um, I still got to go to the gym and write a paper and get some sleep because I got to get up at six in the morning for, for class. But, uh, you know, I'm glad that you guys were all here. Um, thank you for blessing. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Um, I was trying to do something else. Um, that is not, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that at all. Uh, but, um, anyways, sorry. I'm about, now you censor me. <laughs> no, I, I accidentally pinned the message whenever I was trying to click off your message and then I went to go unpin it and I accidentally deleted it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that, but but yeah, Ace, feel free to put that in the Discord so we can pray for you. Um, or if any of you guys also have any prayer requests, feel free to put them in there as well. Um, but I really do got to get going. I'm sorry, I got to rush out of here. But thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. 
Hopefully all you all learned something tonight. Feel free to join us in our challenge that we're going to be trying to go forth and do this week and the coming weeks. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for blessing my night. You guys have really been a blessing to me. Um, and I pray that we have been a blessing to you as well. Um, so I'll give you guys a quick benediction and I'll send you back out. Uh, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. I hope you guys all have an amazing night. Thank you for joining me. And I'll be praying for you guys all the time. See you around.